Hi, my name is Kristen. I'm with Lyft Leadership, and we're doing our Learn with Lyft today. And this morning, we have Josh Mize with us. Josh is a video and advertising and branding expert. He's also the chief attention getter and executive producer at C47 Films. He's that here. Yeah, that's him. He's here to talk to us today about the five keys to owning your influence online using video. So with that, I will hand it over to Josh and let him take it away. Okay, so thank you. Um, for those of you who know Lyft Leadership, um, this is not Gal. Uh, this is Kristen. And uh, so at the bottom there, it's a little bit weird. She's logged in as Gal because uh, you said she's she's got a conflicting meeting right now, right? A conflicting meeting. So she'll jump on later. Yeah. So yeah. I, we, I, I'll drag slowly so we have time to see Gal too. There we go. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm Josh Pies and I am, I call myself the chief attention getter and basically um, my company C47 Films is a video and branding consultancy. Uh, we work with small, medium and large businesses all over the world um, solving uh, the problem of getting attention. That's really at the core of, you know, that's what we do. So as I know you know, the world shifted like, I don't know, five weeks ago, everything's changed. And I actually started noticing a shift in digital communication long ago. I've been doing this a very long time, um, but never has it been so more so apparent as it is right now. Um, a couple of years ago, a lot of my peers and even myself still were leaning on big branded productions. I mean, I'd have a huge crew together and we'd be throwing around five and six figures to create a single video. And we still do. There's merit behind, you know, having the main corporate overview video and the sales video, you know, for your product and your service, or go, if you're going to a convention, you know, you want to make, have a great video running in your booth. Things like that still have great value because they're applied in the right way. But what you can't do, and none of us can do, I can't do it, even Pepsi and Coke don't do this. They don't spend $50,000 per video to do content you know, two, three, four times a day, that would be unsustainable. And so really we, we know that there's two different worlds. There's this big world of really important high dollar videos. And then there's this other world where we need to, as individuals, as solopreneurs, as small and medium businesses, we need to figure out how to own our voice and our influence for our marketplace, but do it with high frequency and relatively low dollars. And so that's really what I want to talk to you uh, today about is, I, you know, I've got a public talk that I give from stage called The Five Keys to Owning Your Influence Online Using Video. It's a very long title, but it's really, um, it, it is very clear. I'm going to give you five overarching concepts with actionable steps under each one of them so that you can get the self-permission, but also the tactics to go ahead and start launching into creating video online. If you're not creating video currently, you need to. If you are, I promise you by the end of this, you're gonna get some clarity on how to move forward for your brand in maybe new and different ways. So stick with me. Uh, and I wanna start with point number one, key number one, which, um, you know, this is a family show, so I won't say it the way that sometimes we, we occasionally will say it, but get over yourself. So key number one is get over yourself. You, you can see where the blank might've been to make it not family friendly, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll skip that. Um, so this is all really actually about self-limiting beliefs. Um, I, I was actually on another call this morning with a, a different organization talking more or less the same topic. And one of the things that I, I said for the first time, and I was like, wow, I, I needed to say this before, um, people in the United States traditionally have been more afraid of public speaking than they have anything else. They would rather jump into a pit of snakes than be on stage. It's crazy. And the truth is that you, what you feel feels as real as maybe anything. And so therefore it becomes your roadblock. And so I want you to work on getting over yourself because the truth doesn't match the sense that you're going to have a massive failure or an embarrassment or close your business because you said something wrong. Anything that's in the back of your head, like I can't do this is a self-limiting belief that will hold you back from doing this. Yep. So we need to own some truth here. Your first video is your worst video. <laughs> I don't care how good you are in your first pass. Your second pass will get better. Your 50th pass will be infinitely better. 
So, you know, I used to ski. And I remember my first time down the slope, um, I, I was probably about 13, 14 years old. And I was watching little kids just like slamming down the hill. And it was very hard for me to wrap my head around the idea that maybe their parents had them skiing from the time they were 18 months old. So a seven-year-old was just crushing me. And I got this, the, they kept telling me to have the pizza wedge, which sounded really little kid. And I didn't want to have the pizza wedge. I wanted to have the straight skis. I wanted to fly like a pro, but I'm 14 years old, getting shown up by seven-year-olds and it was embarrassing, yeah. but it really shouldn't have been because that was my first pass. Now, years later, I was slalom skiing and doing moguls and teaching other people. I had figured it out over time. And this is the same, this is a universal principle. You have to start somewhere. And you, you know, actually what's cool is that you are actually starting above the bottom. And here's why. Nobody expects you to be a video expert. So they're not waiting for a Ron Howard production. But they are, and this is, this is how you need to come at your videos, they are willing to accept you as an expert, just not a video expert. And people will for themselves draw these lines. So if you are expert, in an industry and you are going to express your expertise on behalf of educating and growing your audience, no matter how bad your video may be in comparison to high quality visual experiences, everybody's going to excuse it because they're there for the expertise. They're there for you. And so all of the other stuff, your audio hiccup, who cares? Lighting's bad and you're kind of backlit. I wanna, we're going to talk about how not to do that, but frankly, if you're backlit and you're still delivering value, the value and the ideas lead. Right. So you really do need to get over all these self-limiting beliefs and start testing the waters because when do you start? You start now, you start today. If you keep putting it off, you're only hurting yourself. You're not helping anybody else. And that's the name of the game. This whole point is this is a relationship economy and you need to build relationship by being a giver. And you give freely of your expertise. And in exchange, you become known as the expert. And the experts get recommended. They get hired. They get seen as the go-to. I want to be the go-to, don't you? So that is point number one, is get the blank over yourself. Cut your BS, which is a belief system. Cut those self-limiting beliefs out so that you can free yourself up to actually try the rest of this. So point number two, I'm going to grab, here, here we go, here we go. See that right there? That's a phone. Oh, that's, that's my crazy friend. He's getting a cameo in here. I had to throw him under the bus. That's Fred. He's weird. Um, so that's a phone. And it is the most powerful film tool in the history of motion picture capture. Now, let me put some context around this. I've got more than 40, actually more than 50 now, film and television awards from festivals and competitions from around the world. I'm highly awarded. These are notable name droppables. I could go over the list. I use cameras that sometimes are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars when you put all the parts together. I'm telling you, abandon all of that the way I have and start embracing. Welcome, Gail. Hey. Sorry, I'm late. It's all good. <laughs> hey, you know my shtick anyhow. <laughs> Doing good, Gail. Good to see you. <laughs> All right, so I was just in the middle of explaining, Gal, that this is the most powerful film tool on the planet. And the reason why, if you think about it, it's filming in HD or 4K, depending on which phone you have. And I'm gonna tell you right now, don't worry about 4K, just clean images are what you're looking for. It is connected to the internet, so you can go live or you can record and post later. You can easily, just on an iPhone, without having to have any edit software, trim the front and the back off of your video. Because we've all seen those videos where somebody reaches in and starts and then reaches in and stops. You can cut that off really, really easy. So now, if you're you know, going for the one take wonder experience, you at least have the finger pushing out of the way. It will adjust for your lighting and your audio on its own using auto settings, but you also can control those. And you can edit on that if you want to. It is an insanely powerful tool. And I tell this to everybody, look, complexity is the enemy of action. The more layers and steps you add to anything, the more likely you're not going to do it, or you will do it at least less frequently. So let's say you're really excited about, you know, going to Best Buy and dropping a thousand dollars on a camera and a thousand dollars on a lens and a couple of data cards, and you got a tripod and you bought some lights and you bought all this stuff that you've never used before. And let's say you're even willing to read the manual for each one of those things. So you've done all of that homework. Now, 
You got to set it up. You got to film it. You got to take the data card out. You got to put it in a computer. You've got to figure out where to put the file. You've got to go ahead and figure out an edit program to trim off your start stops if you're filming yourself. And then you can upload it to the internet. It's a lot of steps. You can eliminate almost all of those if you just are willing to use the easy way, which is your phone. And it, it's amazing how shockingly similar the output is if you're going to AB a phone versus an amateur using higher quality equipment. In fact, frequently what ends up happening is the phone is doing so much work for you, it's solving problems that you didn't even know existed. And it looks better and sounds better because it's working on your behalf. The pro stuff is expecting you to be the pro. And so it's got way more layers of stuff. So avoid that. Um, some other basic tactical things that I want to uh, help you with. You know, God built us with eyes here and not here, which means vertical video doesn't make any sense unless you're going to do things where you're releasing two vertical platforms. So stories, Facebook and Instagram are vertical. If you're building for, for that exclusively, go for it because they've, they have built their platform to honor nine by 16. But the rest of us are doing 16 by nine and that's the ratio, 16 by nine. And that really, it's, it's more applicable to shoot horizontal because, well, a variety of things. Most platforms still are. Most monitors and laptops, you know, TVs, they're all 16 by nine. So if you shoot vertical video, it displays weird. And let's say you hit internet gold. Let's say you, you did the thing that needs to go viral and you wanna reuse it 10 different times in 10 other videos. Widescreen or 16 by nine edits into other things better than vertical video. It's an editing nightmare for guys like us who maybe have to clip things in and make magic out of it when it's vertical. So try to avoid that. Change your phone settings to be a smaller file size for a couple of reasons. So you want, uh, here, here's the setting to remember. Put it in 1080, which is also known as HD. Have your frame rate somewhere between 24 and 30 frames. It shouldn't be variable. So you'll have options, either 24 or 30. And the reason why is wh what you're doing isn't going to a big screen. It's going to a social platform that is already gonna compress whatever file size you send it to something smaller. And ultimately your end consumer isn't going to have a change of experience from 4K to 1080 and from a higher frame rate to a lower frame rate. It is imperceptible differences once it's to the end user. So it will be a smaller file size on your phone when you keep it and it'll actually transmit to the internet more easily because it is a smaller file size. So there's no reason to have this big giant file. So we're gonna shoot widescreen with the smaller file sizes. And frankly, if you have an older phone where maybe there's less storage and maybe it's not you know, in the age of 4K, your options might've been 720 and 1080. And I'm not gonna get into the details of what that means for you other than I wanna give you permission. If you really wanna reduce file size more, it's not even gonna hurt you to go down to 720. There's a lot of video pros who would cringe with that, but let's worry about the end consumer experience. That's what matters. And they're not gonna care whether it's 720 or 1080. It's just the bottom line. You're trying to express an expert concept to people who need your voice the final resolution at 720 will never be really warm uh, and, and enjoyable on a 40 foot screen in a movie theater. You also will never be putting it there. So with that in mind, keep it simple, keep it small, keep it accessible. So smaller file sizes. Other things to consider are um, the grand selfie thing, you know, where you're you know, trying to walk and talk or at least keep your hand still, but after 10 minutes of talking, you can't do it anymore. Stop doing that. So here's how to stop doing it on the cheap. You go to Amazon and you find a tripod if you don't already own a tripod in about the $20 range. Now you can get the cute little ones like here. Here's a, you know, I'll throw this in a backpack and it's really small and I can put it on a table. That's fun. I like these but I'm even talking about something that looks like a traditional tripod that will actually stand from the floor up. And a lot of them come with a spring clamp that'll hold your cell phone. We're looking at 16 to maybe $25 for a full setup that's completely competent. And that is the only tool I'm recommending you spend money on right now. 
A lot of people might want to grow, add microphones, add lights, do all these things over time. If you're a tech geek like me, you're craving the video guy to say, here's permission to go spend $1,000 on toys. No, just spend 15 to 20 bucks, 30 bucks, whatever it is, keep it tight and get that tool. But a lot of people already have a nice still camera. Maybe you got kids and you wanted to take soccer practice photos or whatever. And so you got a nice camera that I'm telling you not to use, but you probably also have a tripod. The cool thing about that tripod is the screw on that is a quarter 20. So what that means is it's a quarter inch in width and it's 20 threads, I believe, per inch. Don't even worry about that thread count. It's universal. So on every consumer and small format pro camera, it's all going to be the quarter 20. Now, if you have kids, likely teens and preteens will have a selfie stick somewhere in their bedroom buried under something. Ask them to go find it and then unscrew the spring clamp head that was screwed on with a quarter 20. So the thing that I just told you to spend 20 bucks on, you may already have in your house if you already have a tripod and you already have a selfie stick, you just put them together and now you're ready to have something holding your phone so that you can do exactly what I do, which is talk with your hands and I can't stop them for some reason. I feel like Ricky Bobby, I don't know what to do with my hands. Um, but uh, what you shouldn't be doing with your hands is holding your phone through the whole thing. So it's cheap and it's easy. Some other quick tech tips before I wanna jump into point number three. The light goes on your face. Try not to be backlit, that's the bottom line. So um, if you have an open window in front of you and the camera's between you and the open window, so the light's on you and the camera's on you, you're doing well. If the camera's on you and the light is on the back of your head, it's actually kind of funny because the, the cell phone knows to try to take the human and make them more visible, but you're asking it to do un unnecessary extra work. So suddenly you're going to get a whole bunch of weird pixelation and things that are, it's your phone working hard on your behalf and there's some negative consequences to it and it does degrade the image quality slightly. So we wanna just help your phone help you and keep the light on your face. Now, if you have roughly even lighting in your space, try not to overthink it. You know, it's just, you know, there's a lot of homes where, may, and actually I can tell you on the first floor of my home, we have a couple of uh, sconces and we have a couple of things that are actually incandescent bulbs. It's more mood lighting than anything else. We have giant picture windows. So in that situation, the picture windows are gonna win over any of the lights I actually have that I could turn on. And so I have to use those to my advantage. I just make sure I'm looking at the picture window and the camera's looking at me. And so I am front lit and there's my success right there. That's all I need to do. Um, in fact, I actually have a lot of friends who have like fifth floor, sixth floor condos that um, they look out onto the ocean. So you get to enjoy an ocean view while the camera's looking at you and you're lit. That's, that's kind of how it works. So um, how am I doing so far, Kristen, Gal, and Wayne? Do you have any questions before I dive in? Because I can rattle this off presentation style, but I'd rather go interactive. Does anybody have anything that they want to ask? Uh, everybody's wanna, muted, wait, there you go. I just want to ask Wayne, Wayne, are you doing anything with donors right now and video with your phone? Uh, just a little bit, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to be a part of this, kind of fine-tune some stuff. Uh, uh, the, uh, our, our dean is doing a lot of it, and he's asked for some stuff, you know, to help him. So uh, both of us are, are looking at doing that. Uh, I think for my, you know, about the only thing we can do now is to reach out to our donors through social media, and uh, I, I've just got to get better at it. Uh, sure. You know, I mean, they understand the first time, you know, we, hey, this is a, a new world we're in, but yeah. after the second, third time, they expect a little bit better. You know, I, I've gotten over the uh, holding the phone and doing that sort of thing. So, and I do have a selfie stick and all that. So I, I've used that and that's been very, very helpful. There are Good. some things really when it comes to donors, uh, along persuasion, along with consensus, social norms, that are really, really important that I've learned since you and I work together that this video can be extremely powerful for you and the, your work you're doing. So um, learn all this stuff because Josh has some great things and then we can follow up with that other stuff. Uh, I'd love to. I'd love to, yeah. So Wayne, something that I want to add now because it's on my mind um, is, uh, and it's going to take some maybe answers from you. Um, 
am I right to assume that when you're speaking of donors, it's probably a pool, maybe a large pool of donors who are small gift donors, but then there's probably also large gift donors. And though they may all be exposed to certain messaging, you may work harder with the large gift donors, spend a little more time, maybe be more personal with those messages. Does that sound true? That's correct. Uh, okay. if ones that a very limited amount of uh, correspondence with be more general and just updates on what's going on at, at the university and for their college and that sort of thing. But really drilling down and getting some, you know, some salient points and uh, to the, to the uh, heavy hitters, those donors mm -hmm. are giving a lot and making okay. it very personal. Yeah. So on that level, what I'd like to um, uh, suggest is that I am a big fan of what I frequently call gratitude videos, which um, it may not be the tone that you take necessarily, but let me explain what I've been telling people to do with these gratitude videos. These are one-off videos that never make the public eye. So I tell people, go ahead and put them on YouTube, but put them on as a unlisted video. I can't search them, I can't find them. It's a video that I create for one audience. So let's, Joe Smith gave a million dollars one time to the university, let's, so let's create a character. And in uncertain times, there's volatility, and Joe Smith may have the fleeting thought, gee, I wonder what my million dollars is doing at, at you know, X university right now, in the light of this. If you want to care for that relationship and give them an update, that's not something that you can do on a big broad level, but what does it look like when you take the time to say walk into the stadium, you got a stadium behind you, so maybe they gave to the sports program, um, walk into the stadium and shoot from the middle of the field, a two or three minute personal video giving them a couple of ideas on how the, the school is responding to the situation at large, maybe how the dean of uh, admissions is working with the, the head of the athletics program to do X, Y, Z really important things to keep their vision and their passion alive at the college. You say those things in a three or four minute thing and then maybe invite them in the video to hang out and have a meeting with you with those people who you may have name dropped and already teed up that, you know, hey guys, a meeting might be coming but you literally email them a video and say, I, I created this video for you, would you please watch it? There's no long form thing, just email them with the link, you know, and hopefully you've got enough, like they know your name, so they would open your email. Just say, hey, I made a video just for you, I expect only one view on this, it's my, literally for you, sir, give me a call when you see it. It's a lot of effort, but also they're a big donor. So showing that level of care to somebody is rare and it's really refreshing. And so it's, it's an application of video that I don't see very often. In fact, I don't want to see it very often. I want it to just be happening. I'm not supposed to see it if I'm not the target. Um, so it's, it's a play that most people, I mean, nobody would be publicly explaining that in a social media setting, but for your purposes, I think it'd be really cool. That's a great idea. Yeah, I like yeah. Cool. All right. Well, I'll move on to point number three, because I know there's a lot of people watching. And hopefully that idea that I shared with Wayne, anybody who's watching, maybe that resonates for you. Any business can share gratitude. And any human can share gratitude. And sometimes I do it publicly. I've, I've actually done gratitude videos where I just thank my whole team, you know, and I want people to hear why I value my team and what their roles are. And so making that public, you know, yeah, Bruce might share it with his wife and say, hey, honey, Josh still thinks I'm pretty okay. Like I, you know, so I don't mind doing that a little bit publicly, but then sometimes there's the private gratitude that has to happen, which is what I suggested Wayne, you know, look at for that specific donor set, who frankly, a lot of those people don't want their business to be publicly known. Maybe they're too well known already and they hit the newspapers and it would be inappropriate to call them out. So you can do something that respects their boundaries. Um, but anyhow, so moving on, I'm a huge advocate of batching your work like Betty Crocker. So that is actually point number three in the five keys to owning your influence online using video. I really wish I could shorten that title, but it's worked. Um, so basically, I mean, think about when you're making cookies. Do you make one cookie or do you make cookies? Do you put a tray of 12 in or do you put a tray of one small cookie in? When you're in a manufacturing facility, and I've done a ton of work in the manufacturing world, I don't see them make one-off parts unless they're rapid prototyping to get proof of concept, but once they're to market and they're to scale, 
they don't make one part, they make 500 parts, 50,000 parts, whatever it is, they're making a lot in one shot. I want you to make a lot in one shot too. The reason why I want you to do this um, really is I, I've met more than my fair share of people who try to do like a video a day. So they've come up with a schedule and like every morning, 9 a.m. for 15 minutes, I'm gonna do a video. And what ends up happening is you're, you're changing, massively changing your own behavior and you're expecting the world to respect that boundary of that time that you've set and they, it won't. And so you will break whatever habit you're trying to create. You will get discouraged. You will stop. I don't want that to be a thing for you. So um, there's kind of two phenomena I want you to, to grab here is one, you need to batch your work and set a schedule not only to accomplish it, but to release it. And we'll, we'll talk through that for a second. Um, but also, uh, you need to batch it in a way where your first set of batches, first couple of months, are manageable. And when you figure things out, you'll start adding more because you figured out how to do it. If you decide that you're going to batch 30 videos every month because there's 30 days in the month, you're asking too much of yourself. So we're going to start with thinking about one video a week. But how do we do that? So I call this the Monday plan. First Monday of the month. I want you to sit down with your cup of coffee for an hour. Grab a napkin and a felt tip pen. This is important. It is really, really hard to write on a napkin with a felt tip pen. It keeps you from writing too much. I want you to have a handful of video topic ideas. Now, if you feel like there's a whole bunch of bullet points under a topic heading, there's a category of videos that you've just identified and those sub bullets are likely individual videos. So people run out of content. I hear about it all the time. And, you know, and I actually early on when I was creating my own content, I noticed that I was so close to it that I skipped steps. I assume everything's in groups and I finally challenged myself. If I were to teach you how to produce a, a, a movie, there are 178 line items of things that I do as a movie producer that I had never really noticed, I just do. That's 178 line items that all need their own explanations and have their own details. So if I have three per, I've got what? Like five, 600 video, video topics? That's an insane amount of data, but if you don't step back and start writing it down and then looking at categories and subcategories, you won't have a sense of how much you have. And um, right now, I'll give you a little bit more self-permission. Let's say you do some big topic ideas. Actually, here, uh, Gal at Lift Leadership, she's a certified DISC expert. And we're currently working together on an overview of DISC. A very simple, this is what it is. Okay, fine. Well, DISC is broken out into D, I, S, and C. There's four letters that have different personality types. All right, okay, so now we suddenly have four more videos. Now we have five total. But to really understand DISC, I mean, it's a whole certification program. It takes like days to figure this stuff out. So and even at a surface level, and then it takes a lifetime to practice it. So there's, you know, there's a lot there, but until you start peeling it back and go, oh, how does a D interact with an I? How does a D interact with a C? You know, now we've got more topic headings. So we could literally create, I don't know, hundreds of videos for DISC because there's a lot to talk about. So ultimately Monday one, you're going to start coming up with ideas. And if you decide that you're going to talk about the top level stuff later in future videos, you can mine down and it doesn't undo the value of your previous videos. I want you to have a goal of coming up with five video topics. That's Monday one, Monday two, and you're gonna put it down for the rest of the week. Don't touch it the rest of the week, Monday two with your coffee in hand, go to a, a good clean location, set up your camera on your tripod, your phone on your tripod, and film the five video topics. So now you're gonna have five video topics, what we call them the biz in the can. So um, you've got them in the can, they're on your solid state memory in your phone, and they're gonna sit there for a week. I don't want you to do anything else. I want this to be easy. So you spent about an hour on a Monday, then you spent maybe an hour and a half on the next Monday. The following Monday, you're going to trim the finger push off of each one of the videos, and then you're gonna send them to uh, either Facebook direct using the creator suite, which is where you can go ahead and schedule your posts, or you're going to find a posting program that will help you schedule things. Um, the old school program that a lot of people know about is Hootsuite. Um, we use Postfity in our company, P-O-S-F-P-O-S-T-F-I-T-Y. 
I don't really actually know how to even pronounce it. It's a terrible name, but they're very effective. Um, and what we like about them is uh, they can schedule posts to LinkedIn as well. So LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, it covers like all the majors. And uh, you will schedule your videos to be released. And you're going to do it for one time per week. So for the next five weeks, you will have that coverage. And then the following week, so you've done three Mondays in a row, the third Monday being scheduling, the fourth Monday you start over. The reason why you don't take a day off or a Monday off, don't stop the rhythm. Every Monday morning you do this. And now what you've done is you're going to get ahead of yourself because you're going to write another five videos. You're going to then film another Monday out, another five videos. So now that's your, what is that? Your fifth Monday, you are filming your next five videos. Your sixth Monday, you're scheduling your videos and you didn't have your first videos scheduled out until the third week. So now you're two weeks ahead. Mm -hmm. If you keep doing this, it's like every 15 weeks, you're like, you're going to be like double the videos out or something like that. I forget what, what the math was. I actually have it written down somewhere, but ultimately you're always getting ahead of yourself and that's good. You might get sick and you need a break. You're ready for a break and you can restart the Monday plan a week out if you got sick. Maybe you just want to take a vacation and you don't want to have to keep your Mondays going. Well, if you've started this, you'll have padding. As you get further out and you get a couple months into this, you'll also have figured out what's working, what doesn't work, what you like, what you don't like, where you can maybe add more content and keep going. You're going to figure this out and you're going to modify and iterate as needed. But this gets you into the game and it gets you ahead of the game. And that's really the point. So that's point number three. Point number four is not about scheduling, like the fact that you have to on the third Monday of your cycle schedule, but build a schedule for release that has merit. Meaning, if you can figure out who your customer profile is. So let's, you know, Wayne, my guess is most of your donors are adults. They're probably also adults who are not just out of college and, you know, figuring it out, working part-time at Starbucks and still kind of at intern level, entry level. They don't have disposable income. These are 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80-year-olds who have maybe some kids, they've bought their first house. So what would be the time we might reach these, you know, these people? Lunch breaks at work, after the kids are in bed, Sunday nights in between uh, football games. Those are all potential times where you might release video content and do it with regularity for a while so you can see how the market behaves and see if your guess was right. You can always iterate later and they'll stay on, uh, you know, online. So there's always available. You're not wasting your time if you miss the mark, but take a good guess at who your audience is and where they will one receive you. So, you know, um, I tell people all the time, uh, realtors follow me like crazy. You know, I love that. It's a good audience to work with. And you know, most of them are speaking to residential conversations. They're not commercial realtors. And uh, they post in Facebook and Instagram most of the time because that's where you're going to catch people in family-minded conversations. Posting on LinkedIn, you're actually interrupting people's day while, while these potential home buyers are busy as engineers and as maybe professors or whatever they're doing, you're asking them to turn off professional mode and turn on home mode. You're catching them at the wrong time and in the wrong frame of mind. So making some psychological, uh, demographic, maybe even some geographic choices if you're starting to push, um, uh, if, if you've got the budget to start doing ad buys, you, you know, you got to target all of those demos, geos, psych psychographics to try to figure out how to get into their head. That's really the goal is you've got to get your message to them. So write a schedule that kind of makes sense to you and start testing and observing and modify your schedule as needed. So that's key number four. And finally, key number five, and I, this is hard depending on your personality type, especially high eyes like me. We like to hear ourselves talk, but we don't necessarily like to listen. And so that is the, the fifth key is to listen to your audience because the moment somebody says something to you, there's data. They might say, thanks for the message. Okay, the data is this resonated enough for them to take action to say thank you. They might ask a question. One, I always say, answer the question immediately, but start with, I'm so glad you asked that. Give them gratitude. Answer their question and then let them know 
that you're going to create a video on that topic for them. Now, if it's a topic that needs to be addressed immediately, you may have an extra video mandate on yourself for the week, which is good. I'd rather see that. But if you can work it into your schedule and set it up for the next batch, that's really cool too. But I always tell people, whoever brought the idea up gets the credit. So thank that person and tag that person once that video releases. So Gal, if you um, typed something in on one of my videos and I answered it back, then I, when I create the video, it's like, so Gal from Lyft Leadership asked me a question and I, I really, I already answered it for her, but I want to elaborate on it because I bet she's not the only one who was wondering. And so you, you answer the question and then you close with, thank you, Gal, for bringing this to everyone's attention. That was really important. The likelihood that one, Gal is going to see it because you took the time to tag it, it's pretty high. The likely, likelihood that she's going to appreciate that you took the time for her is pretty high. And the likelihood that she might share it is much higher than if you hadn't tagged it. In fact, there's always the chance that you took, the, took that idea and if she felt personally about it, she could even be offended if you don't say, you know, Gail came up with it, if you take credit for it. So I love the gratitude play in situations like that. So key number five is listen and respond with your listening ears on. Those are the five keys. Get over yourself, use the tech that's in your hand, batch your work, schedule, based on your best guess of who your audience is and listen to your audience and give them what they're asking for. Now you should just shut this off and go start creating videos. <laughs> so I have a couple questions for you, Josh, real quick that came to yeah. mind. So with regard to scheduling, so you said when you, you know, you on your third week, you go out and you schedule everything. Mm -hmm. Do you, but then you had after that, okay, think about when you're going to meet people. Is that just for getting, your first batch is you get it out there and then you kind of look at what's happening and that gives you more data to actually have an idea of when people are going to be watching this stuff? Is that the reason why? Well, yeah, I, I guess the, the truth is that when you're creating your schedule, you likely already have a sense of who you would like to talk to. Right. And you can surmise what their availability is and what their usage is on Facebook. I, I will tell you that um, I, I frequently, you know, get reports and all sorts of data on, on user behavior for social media. It's important in my world to check on that. And it almost never surprises me. I, I look at it and go, oh yeah, I, I could have told you that. Mm -hmm. I could have guessed that. And and it's not because I've spent so many years in marketing that I could guess that. It's because I'm a human who kind of gets how other humans work. You know, um, if you're busy in your work day, but I need to catch you on a work topic, I'm probably going to go where, where you might go in social during your work day when you're thinking about work. If I'm, if I have a family brand and it's about, you know, I know infant items I might be trying to actually catch moms during nap time. So I might be looking up when the most common nap time is during the day and trying to schedule my posts to land at the most universal nap time schedule mm -hmm. to try to get into their world. So it's really, it's just kind of about, hmm, do I know the general age of my, my audience? Okay, I'll start with that. Do I know generally kind of what their employability looks like? You know, um, you know Gail, I know you have worked a lot with hospital systems. You've spent enough time that you probably know some common behaviors. And yeah, we, we're profiling and stereotyping people for their benefit. So th there's nothing wrong with trying to figure out how people behave and deliver at that point. So watching how that manifests and whether you were right is going to be critical go going forward. But on your first schedule, take a shot at figuring it out because the likelihood that you have a sense of where they're gonna be and how they're gonna behave is pretty darn high. Right. What about if you absolutely have just no clue or your audience is maybe fairly broad? Is there kind of a peak time that you have noticed that if you're on Facebook or on Instagram on whatever, that okay, pick this time to start and then you can maybe drill down? Badly, 11, a, 11 in the morning till two in the afternoon, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday is a high pickup time for all social media. It doesn't matter what the platform is. 
Um, obviously, and this is not adjusted for time zones. If you're an East Coaster who wants e even coverage all over the, you know, the whole country, um, you know, you're going to release your piece of content once and you may want to just kind of split the difference and I guess land in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, yeah, the, I mean, the harsh truth is that people's productivity starts waning at the end of the week. They start getting distracted and they turn to social media for a moment of relief. And, you know, playing that behavior and also Sunday night football, um, when the game gets slow, half times, things like that, that is a huge time where people are sedentary with their phone in their hand. You can catch a lot of eyeballs then as well. Um, more on the socialist of socials. I don't want to use socialist. Um, the most social of socials being Facebook and Instagram and where people hang out a little bit less on things like uh, LinkedIn. But, uh, but even on LinkedIn, I mean, business-minded people, if they're going to start getting bored with the game, might still go to LinkedIn. Um, you're going to find those behaviors are generally true all over. Right. Although I will warn you, though, so the whole idea of um, having a broad appeal right. worries me. The riches are always in the niches. So um, l let me take it to an extreme and a little bit out of what your content is. Let's talk about if we were to do an, a media buy on Facebook and I had only $1,000 to try to reach as many people as I can and get them to respond. So it's not just, hey, be seen. Because I can be seen. $1,000, Zuckerberg will take your money. It'll show whatever you want to create to people. That doesn't mean it's valuable. And so if I've got this broad scope where I want to broadcast to all of the United States, there's 330 million people, it will be seen, but it doesn't mean I'll get a response. If I want to mine down, let, let's take it to a taco shop in San Diego. If a taco shop in San Diego spends $1,000 for a nationwide buy, nobody's shopping from New York City in San Diego's taco shop. But if they can go ahead and get dial down and find foodies in San Diego and then express a message with that thousand dollars to foodies in San Diego, they're going to have a much higher shot at getting some kind of a response. So if, if you feel like you want to reach everybody, I respect that. I want to reach everybody too. I'd like the whole world to understand my value proposition and really start leaning into being an expert because I believe somewhere deep down, everybody's a little bit further on their pathway than the person who's behind them and they can add value to others. I believe that. I'm not going to reach everybody. I'm not even going to try. So I focus on small businesses and personal brands, usually in a um, business to business category or a lot of higher education where you can, it's frequently people who have graduated and understand a certain value proposition that looks business to business. So Wayne, you're in a world that I'm very comfortable in. Um, and so I, I want to talk to those audiences myself. And if I were to do a thousand dollar media buy, I don't even think I would do all of the country with that data. I think I would do central Florida with that data. I, I live in central Florida. I also have an office in, in the Western New York area. So those are two targets for me because the likelihood that I might be able to get quick presence with them and actually monetize the relationship and add real value is much higher. So I don't want, if, if you feel like you've really got a broad audience, I want to challenge you right now that even though maybe you could serve people from a very broad category, you probably can't get to them or get their attention without niching down. And so I'd rather have you serve tight and small. And then as you grow your voice and your expertise, you can start increasing your borders until maybe you're Tony Robbins. Cool. God bless you. I hope you are. But until you have that level of notoriety, you don't. Right. So niche down. Right. And the other question I had too is, I'm sure there's a sweet spot in the length of videos. So mm -hmm. not too short, not too long. What is that sweet spot that we want to target? Sure. So um, there, there's a variety of truth depending on the social platform. Some of it is because of consumer behavior. Some of it is because of algorithms. So um, you want to be in the one to five minute space anywhere in between in most applications because people, really people can only take one idea and run with it. If you give them too much, you'll actually lose them in the moment, but you also might lose them in longer than just the moment because oh, I never get anything from that guy's information. 
or I, it's too heady, I, I, I can't do it. And even if they're not saying it, they're feeling it. So you wanna deliver one simple idea and you wanna do it clearly and you don't wanna overdo it. So you don't wanna spend too long. But on Facebook Live or most live applications, you're rewarded for going much longer. Yeah. You're also rewarded for being more interactive. So the more people you have in the room, the more people, the more interactions, the more, um, like actually if you're gonna go live, try to assign somebody to be in the chat below and give you feedback like, oh, hey, Mary just asked this. Or, or even if they're not doing that much, keeping the chat going, Facebook loves. So longer can be better in that application. Mm -hmm. um, YouTube, and frankly, I don't do much YouTube. And, and it's weird for a video guy, uh, or at least most people think it's weird for a video guy. Um, but it can be really difficult to become uh, essentially YouTube famous without spending an inordinate amount of time focusing on that. And it becomes your job. It becomes your career. So I look at YouTube more as an opportunity to use it as a server. <laughs> um, we definitely use YouTube in order to get our content onto uh, LinkedIn because you can't schedule posts for video on LinkedIn, but you can schedule posts with a video link to go onto LinkedIn. So we use YouTube for that. But if you are gonna go live on YouTube or even if you're gonna have a recorded video on YouTube, you get suggested to other viewers based on watch time. The longer you're on and the longer you keep people, the more YouTube loves you because they crave your exclusive eyeballs. So they're trying to keep you a 10 minute video, a 20 minute video that keeps people at least 50% of the time will get recommended. So you got to have high quality ideas. You have to actually share more ideas than I'm even recommending you normally share. Mm -hmm. You need to do it longer if you want to be YouTube famous. But to be perfectly honest, I tell people more or less to avoid YouTube as a strategy because you have to change more behaviors than most people are ready to change. And it's a great tool, great resources on there. I use it a lot for reasons other than going famous on YouTube. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, that's great. And it's interesting, I didn't realize that there was kind of a difference between just stuff that you would post on social media as a video and then the Facebook Live thing. Because Facebook Live seems like that's a relatively new application. I mean... Yeah, I mean, it's a couple years old at this point. And, um, you know, I'm anti-live for people who aren't used to doing video. Um, <laughs> it's hard. I mean, think about it. I mean, it, if the number one public fear or fear of, for all people is the idea that you, um, you know, if you're in front of people that you're going to clam up, you're going to be embarrassed. It's worse than getting into a pit of snakes. I mean, that's, I, I'd rather jump in a pit of snakes than be on a stage. That's an amazing truth that, you know, let, let's lean into that truth a little bit and give people permission to record and try and test and learn. And then as you get more confident, start trying to go live. Right. Okay. Um, I will say, I mean, we're live right now right. and this will also be recorded, super handy. And we're not the only ones doing it. There's a lot of people doing it right now. So right. culturally, I think we all, who are earlier adopters in willing to be on live and give it a go are going to find that we will have peers, many more peers more quickly and culturally that fear will lower because we're proving that we're not damaging our brands even if it was a substandard live experience. Um, we're not going to go out of business because the video quality was a little shaky or I ummed and odd too much. It really will be fine and we're proving that in mass. So I do think that'll start sh changing. Live will be more important. And frankly, I mean, we're doing a live strategy here at C47 that you guys are you know, participating in, Kristen, where you know, this recorded video may get cut up and turned into uplifting moments. And we're gonna share tidbits here and there that will be the recorded stuff. So there's nothing wrong with the idea that maybe your live becomes your recorded. Right. You know, Josh, I want to, uh, if it's all right, um, tell Wayne some things that he, that might be helpful for him in his Absolutely. Years of work. So Wayne and I have worked together in the past. Cool. So Wayne, you and I both know that for stewardship and things with donors, they need to be personal, they need to be unexpected, and they need to be customized. So I just want to give you some ideas of the ways to use this video. People uh, steer away from it. 
Um, and it is extremely powerful when you're working with, with uh, your donors. So um, a thank you from a dean that's personalized. So one of the things that I found in some of the areas that we've been with, they need to be customized. So I just want to give you some ideas of the ways to this video. <laughs> you got me playing back. <laughs> Is somebody on Facebook right now? Double me, no, I think she hit the recording button and it, it played me back. But um, Wayne, being able to, to take the video, so um, some shortcuts we've used in some places is do a, a first part of a video, a last part of a video, and we use it on all of them. And then what you do is you put in the middle section, uh, you go to the Dean's office and, ha and sit down and set your tripod there and just have him say, hey, thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I wanna thank you for your gift to such and such. Um, it was able for us to move forward. Um, and then you can do a ton of those. Like you could have the Dean with a list of names and he just have him, you know, repeat all of the names, just go through it. Um, walking through the school. Um, hey, we went, I wanted to take the day and uh, walk down memory lane with you today. Here's a day, you know, let's walk through the halls of the school. Um, if you have scholarships that you do, um, have your students, you may already have a program where they're doing thank yous. Do you do that already, Wayne? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. um, have them do a video thank you. Take your iPhone in there and then you can just email it to them. Hey, I know we're sending you a letter, but here, here they are, let them see their face, uh, do uh, thank yous. If you know they have a favorite teacher that's still there, or if you have a teacher gathering where you can capture things that are going on, that's another way to do it. Another donor that's given to the same program they have, um, that creates consensus uh, in the group that's interested in this, exactly the same thing that other donor is. Um, I don't leave anymore or go to any organization without my camera and a, a couple of video releases because as you're sitting and talking to them, stories, being able as you're sitting there in a meeting, capture their story on video and ask them if you can use it and share it with other people. You and I both know that as you sit and you talk with people, those are when those stories come out when you're in there, their, their own home with them, right? Capture it right then. Don't get where you think that that has to be professionally done. In fact, um, especially when it comes to donors, I think they're more powerful when they're not professionally done. Absolutely. Um, um, because they're real, you know, and spur of the moment and you can tell. Also, Wayne, I can't remember, were you getting ready to do some construction in your... Yeah, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, we're about to launch our $29 million renovation of the QEP Long Field House. It's a, it is a uh, building on the National Registry. Okay. And, uh, we, oh. we're the only unit that occupies it, academic unit that occupies it on campus. And so we've raised 25 out of the 29 million and uh, we've got the little Delta to finish. And I'm thinking about doing some videos. I, I like your idea about you know, another donor who's given to this to be able to challenge uh, some other folks. I like that. Yeah. And, and I would go through, as you're getting ready to build, I'd go through updates. Don't be scared to set your tripod in front of you and say, hey, it's Wayne this week. I'm coming at you this month with, you know, some new ideas on what's happening with the project. And then you can take uh, still photos and things, um, believe it or not, Josh will kill me, but I've used my iPhone and iMovie and made some things that have been extremely impactful with donors. Shame, shame, shame. <laughs> okay. So I'm not against people getting creative and putting the effort behind stuff. I just know that complexity is the enemy of action. Right. So, right. you know, if you're looking at having a presence in social media that's consistent, you need to avoid adding layers. But when you right. are inspired to show people something and add a certain you know, uh, pizzazz to the experience, sure, if you've got the skills and the tools, or, or even if you don't, go find them. If you're inspired, go, do it. I'm all for that. Well, and this one, Wayne, what I'm talking about doing, it's not something you necessarily would post on social uh, media as much as it would be to email to your donors. 
Right. Um, and what I did uh, was I just went to Apple because um, they have the free sessions and I took an iMovie class, which was enough. I awesome. created, uh, spent the time and created a little beginning and a little end. And then I just put the middle in every single time. So the beginning and the end was the same, you know, pretty basic, your contact information and stuff. And um, what this did was it provided some FaceTime with donors, which is really important right now, since we don't have a lot of FaceTime with donors, it gives you FaceTime in front of them without actually being in front of them. Yes. Extremely, extremely powerful with moving gifts forward and very, very easy to customize. Great. Uh, thank you for all those ideas. And uh, let me, I've got to, in about two minutes, I've got to be somewhere else. Um, sure. And I, I don't, I've not been successful at cloning uh, nor would I think that would be uh, a good idea anyway. Two of me running around is kind of scary. Like said, there's, a, there's enough Wayne Miller to go around already. Oh, yeah, exactly. But Josh, thank you so much. Uh, Gail, yeah. great seeing you again. Let's touch base. Yeah, reach out to me, Wayne. Um, okay. I'm at home. I mean, I'm working from home yeah. the next few weeks, so. so. So the only thing that more that I thought about uh, was to take, uh, you know, have a camera that shows the construction progress. Josh, you have any you have any experience of being able to to pull that off the the camera or whatever uh, and be able to send that you know as uh, here's what's happened for the week similar to what you I love about. that idea um, and I guess what I would need to know is I'd need a little bit of, of information about what the camera is and how it's connected um, but I love the idea of showing progress people love time lapses people love to see stages right. of growth yeah. so yeah. The, the short answer is do it um the long answer is i i'm perfectly willing to help you figure it out so if you want to email me or call me um you are welcome to do that and what i'll do is instead of just giving and i get that from gail I, i've got any time absolutely absolutely yep. perfect perfect yeah we'll, we'll take care of you good deal and gail number two uh <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Kristen. <laughs> and, and, and just remember this, okay? Not Syracuse. You just LSU. Really easy, okay? Thank you so All much, right. guys. Next time I'm in the area, you'll have to give me a tour. I will, absolutely will. Thank you awesome. so much. Thank you, Wayne. Let's talk soon. Absolutely. Okay. Bye -bye. So while Wayne is leaving, I Bye -bye. wanted, um, you know, this is broadcasting to multiple outlets, and Sam Winger, who um, – I, I think the world of this guy, he is uh, graduating soon from the Rochester Institute of Technology. He's been on, um, uh, on set with me a number of times uh, as we've filmed TV commercials. Uh, he's been a phenomenal production assistant and uh, he piped up and, and, you know, I don't have a question right in front of me, but his question was really important. And he said, you know, the common knowledge is that starting in social media is very much a long-term game and it's uh, early on, there are very low results. And he's right. He's 100% right. So here's a couple of things to consider. One, um, you need to know that and own it, that early on, you will have infrequent wins and you need to cling to the ones that happen because in the long run, and we're talking one, three, five, ten 10 years, when you get into the habit of being a content creator who drives value, you will over time be seen and recognized for having done so. I will tell you personally, I only started my own personal content journey about two to three years ago. And I had to lean on these moments that would come out of nowhere. One of them, my friend, uh, believe it or not, his nickname is Zipper. Um, Zipper hits me up and he goes, I just wanted to let you know that you completely changed my life and it was because of one of your videos. Or, no, no, you didn't even say it that way. He said it, I quit my job because of you. I was like, what? freaked me out. I was like, no, he's got no income and I caused it. Come to find out one of the videos that I did, he was inspired to do a complete career pivot, hatched a plan, got his dream job, changed everything, still as great friends with everybody he used to work with. Everything got better and, and there's has to be other factors, but he credited a video that I created with having done that. Apparently I added some real value. And I didn't know it. I hadn't heard much. I had actually had crickets for a while. Yet, I changed somebody's life. That alone was enough for me to want to keep going like crazy. But over time, you start getting interaction. And when you start, you remember the, that fifth point of listen? 
one of the things that I literally only connected because Sam of Sam's question is one of the behavior sets that I exhibit for in my own life that I think everybody needs to apply when creating content. When somebody says something, anything, I, I told you you should respond and deliver value. But I treat every interaction like a networking event. Have you ever gone to a networking event and there's, you know, there's cocktails and you're supposed to work the room and meet people and exchange business cards and follow up and see how you can help them one-to-one? -one? Your content creation journey is making the world your networking event. And it's attracting people who have seen who you are and want to take a moment to interact with who you are. Suddenly you have a pre-qualified moment where you can add value in their world and grow some relationship moments. That is way better networking than that guy's tie is nice and he's wearing something that looks like a name badge. I should find out what he does. That's, it's very surface level. It's, it's also the same thing like, you know, you go into a bar looking, uh, you know, grab a couple of drinks and somebody walks up and says, hey baby, what's your name? Like that guy who's hitting on that girl is hitting on her because she's pretty, not because she's valuable, not because she's a great human, not because she's talented. He literally only saw pretty. And, and of course, that spatial phenomenon, that's the only way he would make that introduction, but you have literally started a relationship on a super surface level. And that's what happens at a lot of networking events. It's, hey, this person looks like I might get along with them, therefore I will have a conversation doesn't mean you'll business-wise get along with them. doesn't mean they can do anything for you or you can do anything for them. So you end up taking this time to exchange business cards to try to figure out if maybe this was worth it. But if you're putting yourself out there and you're able to be seen by an audience, and then they take the moment to go, all right, I'm in. I want to say this. You just proved to yourself that they want some form of relationship moment, and that's real networking. So maybe you only get five comments in the next quarter. Those are high qualified comments. It's a lot of work to get five comments, but it's also a heck of a lot of time sucking work to go to a whole bunch of networking events. Which would you rather do? Build a legacy and a lexicon of giving through video content creation and expressing your expert brand to make people better and therefore reap the harvest of rich relationships that'll be mutually beneficial? Or do you want to go look pretty with a glass of wine in your hand and hope that you maybe hit what I'll call the networking lotto? Because that's what networking events are. You're literally pulling some kind of lever at a casino to see if you can get a payoff. I, you can tell I'm a little bit down on networking events. I've tried enough of them. I'd rather see you play this angle. So Sam, that's my take on you know, the early moments and early moments, early years of being a content creator. You are investing towards relationship in a way where you actually have a shot at getting a payback. And I, I like the idea of investing. And I really like the idea of wise investing. Don't go for the penny stock, go for something that's got strategy. So. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And you know, I think that's the thing is that it's kind of like exercise or going on a diet, right? Like we all expect immediate gratification. You hop on the scale after two days of starving yourself or doing whatever and it hasn't changed and you're like okay well and, and or even worse you're up like 0.2 pounds it's because you've built muscle and you're not recognizing that you've actually made progress exactly and you know i think this is that kind of a thing where it, it's a marathon it's not a sprint and keep putting things out there and you're you are spreading your expertise your value you're giving people information and it it might be a slow burn but you know, you're reaching, you are reaching people and you're adding value, like you said. Um, and it's, it's going to take some time and you just have to sort of stick with it. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. And it's not easy because it can feel like you're maybe losing the game when there's crickets. I had, I had a two or three month period where I had almost like no views on videos. I couldn't figure out why. And then I, I really don't have an explanation for it, but I kept with it, you know, and I, I wasn't putting dollars behind advertising anything. I was hoping for organic. And um, this was early on in my content journey for myself. And maybe I was low on my own strategy. I don't know. Baker's family fre frequently starves for bread. But I promise you, if you don't give up and you keep pushing through and you're willing to learn from every moment, you know, you only either, you, you either win or you learn if you've got the right attitude. There is no fail. So choose, choose to pivot fail to be a learn and figure it out. It takes time.
I, Gail's smirk is funny there because I know she's thinking uh, there's another John Maxwell guy sitting across the table. Yeah, because uh, if, if you're not a John Maxwell devotee, you, you would maybe not know that term. But How do you read my face so well, Josh? <laughs> uh, well, we, we hang out enough. Yeah, yeah we do. We do. <laughs> yep. So cool. Do you guys have anything else? And I, let's quickly check our socials here just to see if anybody else is, is cropping up with some thoughts or ideas. Um, let me see here. I'm willing to hang out for a minute. Let's see here. All right, it's a little quiet on that one. And then where is... Okay. I think we probably are starting to, uh, to wrap up. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm always honored to have a, a, a seat of, of expert position. So that was, that was very kind of both of you. I think the, the information that you provided was really, you know, really valuable. And especially right now when we are all, you know, stuck inside in our homes and we're not getting, you know, any sort of interaction and it's harder to reach people. And I think having that face-to-face -face experience um, you know, be it a one-on-one -on -one gratitude video, which I love that idea, um, or, you know, a Facebook live thing where you're providing some expertise or even short videos. And, you know, this is stuff care you, you know, you can start using now if you haven't and carry it through. So it's a great time to do it. Well, now is the time. Now yeah. is always the time. Yeah. Yeah. Josh, you are wonderful. We always work love working with you. Um, thank you and we just think you're fabulous so thank you for sharing this time with us so that's the sound bite i'm going to keep that i'm going to play it on loop we just think you're fabulous we just think you're fabulous we just think you're fabulous i like that my head's swelling on screen right now hey yeah. you, you know play it as many times as you need to <laughs> thanks i appreciate that well thank you everybody for watching this will stay up on replay i'm sure right yep, yep. And, hey and uh, don't forget to send me the file Yep. Sounds great. Thanks, Josh. Talk to you guys soon. Okay. Bye-bye.